What's up, everyone? Can you hear me? Marcus says, how long is this before, how long before this is to start right now? Tell me if you guys can hear me. Uh, it is uh, the 26th of January, 2020. I look very serious in the thumbnail. Great meeting you at NAM briefly too, Aaron. Uh, NAM was, uh, was really interesting. It was, um, I didn't get to see all the stuff that I wanted to see, unfortunately. I, I honestly did not even make it into the pro audio section, or I did one time for on the first day for a few minutes, and that was it. Uh, but I want to talk about this. After seeing all this gear, and um, I did the video this week with, uh, uh, with the two days ago with Rhett and Dave and Ken about the string gauge, and... Um, and that, and uh, I wanted to talk about spending money on gear and where you should actually spend your money because this, I think, is kind of an important topic, especially after going to NAM. I, what's up, Marcus? I see you on there. Uh, thank you, James. By the way, discount code for anything in my store is RB350. It's 35% off everything. Um, so the let me just quickly talk about the string video here before we get started. So I have no string endorsement. As a matter of fact, I'm not endorsed by any company. That doesn't mean that I haven't uh, that I don't have any company affiliations or know people at companies. I happen to know, know people at a bunch of different companies just from doing this for so many years. Uh, but I don't have a, a string endorsement with Ernie Ball or Daddario or anything. I buy all my strings myself. And I don't like to be beholden to anybody for making a, you know, making a video or anything. I went out and bought this pedal yesterday. This is a pedal by um, JHS, and it has all the tube screamers in it right here. Josh, who I know, made this pedal. Josh, uh, that who has a great YouTube channel, Josh Scott, um, and it has all the different variations of tube screamers in here. I saw this pedal in my friend Keith Williams' 5 Watt World video, and uh, I thought, wow, that's a great idea. I've got a Tube Screamer here that I've had forever, and, um, and I only have one. You guys see I have a lot of pedals back there, but these are pedals that I've had. Thank you, Steven. Appreciate that. Most of the stuff that I have in my studio, I have had for years, literally years. Some things... My flanger pedal, my MXR flanger, I've had since 1978. And I've been collecting all these things, guitars for, uh, you know, probably many of them. I have a classical guitar that I got in 1977. I have, uh, you, you know, a lot of these things were things that I got when I was playing in my band. My acoustic guitar, my one Gibson acoustic that I have, I got from the record label. We had a record deal and we had a budget for an acoustic guitar. That's what I got. But it, it, uh, I have, I did some interesting interviews. Thank you, Brett, with, uh, with some amp builders on the first day I was there before NAM started. And I, I interviewed Michael Soldano, Dave Friedman, who gave me the idea for the string video, uh, Joe Morgan. Um, I interviewed Brian Wampler, who was Wampler uh, Pedals. Um, I, and it was interesting because I was. Talking to them, I'm sitting in front of their amps. Dave Friedman had a Jakey e. Lee head that he was talking about. And I said, what speakers are in the speaker cabinet? Synergy amps. I interviewed Peter as well, who's, who's an awesome guy. Really enjoyed uh, hanging with them. But I asked each person about their speaker cabinets. Thank you, Mark, for that, for the super chat donations. And they said, Dave Friedman said, you know, you're one of the only people that asked about the speaker cabinet. Well, because the speaker cabinet is actually, and David said this on the video, which I haven't put out yet, but he, the speaker cabinet is the most important thing in a way. Okay, whether you're whether it's an IR response and you're using the aux or you're using the uh, neural DSP plugin, whatever it is, all these things, the, the speaker cabinets are EQs, okay? That's how you have to think of a speaker cabinet. When I did the video, if you haven't seen the video I did with the four different speaker cabinets, okay? I used a, a Marshall Head 71 JMP 
and a uh, and a 1980 Park amp, and we used them through four different speaker cabinets: a Marshall cabinet with um, a 100 watt cabinet with 25 watt selections. Thank you, Brooks. A uh, a 65 uh, Marshall cabinet with 65 watt selections, vintage cabinet. A um, uh, a high watt cabinet with 75 watt fanes and a Mesa cabinet with vintage 30. So four different kinds of speakers and four different cabinet constructions. And the amps sounded radically different through them. Same mic placement on the different speakers, but no comparison between them. The cabs are EQs, okay? So if you have an amp and you want to vary the sound beyond mic placement, the mic pre is an EQ. You're going to start introducing phase shift and things like that if you start EQing it, okay? Mic placement is very crucial because the mic is also an EQ. You have to think of it. Or the two microphones are two EQs. And depending on how you blend them or three microphones, it will give you completely different sounds. But the actual cabinet construction uh, is extremely important. If you if you're talking about drums, the uh, the the shell construction, uh, the the heads make a big difference, no question about it. And I'll have a video about drum heads coming out that's going to be similar to the video that we did on strings. Thank you, Martin. Um, but the cabinet makes a bigger difference than the actual amplifier. Changing out the cabinet will make a radically bigger difference, okay? Same thing with the microphone. The microphone is an EQ. If you're going to spend money on things, you spend it on your instruments first because there's nothing more important than the instrument. You can have a modeler like an XFX3. You can have the uh, neural DSP plugins. You can have uh, uh, the, the aux and you're using your actual amplifier with pedals and things like that. There's nothing that, um, there is nothing that makes a bigger difference than your instrument, okay? You spend the money on the guitars, you spend money on your um, on a piano, on a drum set, things like that, the, the actual instrument. The, the reason I did the string video is because the string gauge does make a difference. Now, sure, uh, if I put on a set of 11s, it's gonna have more bass. The point of that video was actually, how does the amplifier react to the string? Okay, it wasn't um, that lighter strings sound better. Lighter strings are more comfortable to play. But Dave Friedman said to me that the the strings the the amplifier reacts better to lighter gauge strings because the point of this was that I would use a tube screamer in front of the amp with the gain turned all the way down. Okay but it would, or most of the way down, it would EQ or high pass, meaning take the low end off the guitar, especially with low tuned guitars. It would take it off before it goes in the amp and the amp would be tighter sounding and have better mid range and not be as woofy. That doesn't mean that, uh, that you don't play 11s or 13s. I play 13s on my Gibson acoustic, okay? And I play eights on my Gibson's electrics. Now go figure that. String gauge does affect acoustic tone, Dean. Dean just asked that. Um, I, uh, uh, thank you, James. I, um, I made the video though to, uh, to show that there is a difference with amplifiers. Okay, not there. I mean, there's a reason that these guys use thin strings. The people I talked about, like Billy Gibbons, well, he saw BB King do it, and BB King used eights, and he said, "Why you work? Why do you work in this hard?" When Billy was using elevens or something like that, why do you want to work this hard? Um, to me, the fact that the the low the lighter gauge strings have less bottom end, the strings interact differently with each other. And it is, um, uh, and it has a much more focused mid range for complex chords if you're playing cleanly. You guys, uh, uh, Camilo, 
Uh, you guys that uh, you were asking me about my uh, Dan Electro, what gauge strings I have on there. Thank you, Anders. Appreciate that. I have nines on it. And that Dan Electro has the lipstick pickups on it. And it has very, um, those don't have a lot of output on the low end. Okay. And the, that guitar has, is really clear when using very dissonant chords. If I'm using, you know, more high information harmonic material, more complex chords, I'm going to want something where the, the bass, the low frequencies are not going to mask the mid range and the top end. And it's typically the mid range that the, that the low frequencies are masking. When I say masking, that means it's, you're producing so much low end from these things, and it may be a subtle thing, but it masks the important information on the inside of the chords, okay? Just like if you have, uh, if you want to take the treble off or make something less trebly, you can add bass to it. And the bass will do the same thing as turn the treble, <laughs> turning the treble down, right? But what you really want to do is you want to get the things to sound as good acoustically as possible before you do anything. That's why when I'm recording drums, I spend so much time tuning them, getting the right heads on them, getting them to the right pitches that correspond with what pitches sound good on the particular drums. Thank you, Phil. Um, every drum has a resonant frequency, meaning when you tap the shell, it will have a pitch to it. It just does. Some drum companies will print the pitch on the inside of the drum, okay? Um, those drums will resonate at those pitches better. There is also a different, uh, uh, if you tune the bottom heads higher on a drum, that is actually where you get a lot of your pitch information from, is the bottom head. Drummers from the 60s, like John Bonham and 70s, would tune more like a jazz drummer, meaning higher. Uh, they would tune the drums much higher in pitch, okay, like jazz drummers would. Then as we progress through the 70s and 80s and 90s, people started tuning their drums lower. They just did, okay, and, and it has a completely different kind of tone. Single uh, ply heads, which would be, if it's a Remo, it's an ambassador, if it's a uh, if it's an Evans head, it's called a um, would be a G1. A G2 is a two ply head, and an Emperor is the is the two ply head that uh, that that um, Remo makes. Okay, so these have very different sounds to them. I'll do a video about that to show you. And uh, so, but don't just assume that because you put on heavy strings on your instrument that you get a better tone. And that was Dave Friedman's point about this. And Dave said to me, he watched the video and he emailed me, he said that the lighter strings actually seem to have vibrate, uh, vibrate more. Um, so, uh, but I wanted to prove a point because that is a, one of these myths, this heavier strings sound better. When I played Frank Gambale's guitar, when I interviewed him last summer, I picked it up and it was unbelievable how light he, and I said, what are these? Are these eights? He said, no, they're nines. And he had incredibly low action, okay? Really low action. It was one of the easiest guitars I've ever played. And I saw Frank play at Nam, and he, and he blew me away. It's one of the best live uh, guitar performances I've seen in the last 25 years. He was phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. Just ripped it up incredible. And um, and Frank had a new guitar out and you could tell that you can tell his guitar is easy to play. Does that mean that Frank has a thin tone? No, he has a fat tone. Alan Holdsworth played eights. He had a massively big guitar tone. Okay. All the, you know, so you can't generalize about these things. Some people, Josh Smith, I heard play and I love Josh's playing. And he uses 12 gauge strings and uh, or 12 or 13, and he sounds amazing. That's comfortable for him. He's a big guy, he's got strong hands, you know. Stevie Ray Vaughan, uh, I found out was five foot five, you know, and 
he wasn't a huge guy, but he was able to play 13s uh, until the end, okay? And and when Dave was telling me that he talked to his guitar tech and uh, he said he went back to lighter gauge strings. Now, somebody says, do string brands make a difference? Okay, I have some D'Addario's right here. I used Ernie Balls in the thing because I had them sitting around here. I have all, you know, I've... I don't change my strings that often. On my Dan Electro, I changed my strings about a year ago, maybe. No, two years ago, probably. Okay, so um, I, I change. So this gets back to the instruments. So where, you, where should you spend your money? Well, obviously, the strings make a big difference. They do. If you watch the video, they actually do make a big difference, right? And that's probably the least amount of money you're going to spend on something Compared to uh, compared to buying a new instrument, okay? Um, and somebody said, oh, you should have done this with a clean sound. It doesn't matter whether it's a clean or distorted tone. The instruments react similarly. You're going through the same preamp stages. The instruments react similarly. Did Alan Holdsworth have a thin sound when he was playing his clean, really complex chords? No, he had a fat sound. And once again... Those complex chords with all those seconds in them sound great with the thinner strings because you don't have all this masking of with the low frequency masking the mid range. Uh, Dean said two years. How how Diadario you? <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, so, anyways, you want to spend your money on instruments first and foremost. Okay. You can buy plugins, you can buy mic pre's, things like that. There, uh, um, none of that is going to make as big a difference as your amplifier or your instrument. But first on your instrument, next on your on your amplifier, things like microphones are important. If you're recording, if you're not going direct, the microphone's extremely important. It's another EQ. And I would spend money on the speakers and the speaker cabinet before I would even spend it on the microphone, okay? So uh, so this is, uh, these are really important things because you everybody's on a, a budget. No, not everybody, but many of us are on budgets. I Like I said, I've bought my stuff. You guys, say, I have a lot of guitars, not 20 something guitars, that's it. Neil Schoen, somebody asked him on his Instagram today, he has 350 guitars. And he's got single guitars that cost more than everything in the studio combined. Um, anyway, so, uh, so I tell people, spend your money on instruments, spend your money on microphones. The mic pre's are not going to make that big of a difference. They're just not. Um, uh, you know, I have an acoustic drum kit here but I have a lot of different snare drums. Why? Because the snare is the most important instrument beyond the kick drum. If you're recording, whether you're doing hip hop and you're using electronic sounds, whether you're doing, uh, whether you're doing rock and you're using real drums, these things are incredibly important. Do cables make as much of a difference? Well, uh, when I interview Eric Johnson, I'll talk to him about that. But to me, cables do not, not make nearly the amount of difference that a microphone makes on a guitar amp. Um, so, uh, so, so, anyways, Nam is really was eye opening. You know, my buddy Dave Rolf, uh, really great friend of mine. We've been friends for 30 years. Great musician. Dave hadn't been to Nam in I don't know how many years, 20 years or so. And he came and he couldn't believe all the stuff that's out, all the new, all the gear. And he says, who's buying all this stuff? And I said, well, you know, there's a lot of different genres of music that people play and a lot of different kinds of instruments, you know, and there's a lot of people in the world that play music. So that's why there's a lot of different things that, uh, you know, that people sell. But um, that's, that is why it's, uh, you know, that, that's why NAM can, had 180,000 people, I think it was the number that came to the, uh, to the show last week. And, uh, you know, 
these things, these pedals here like this, I'm not endorsed by JHS, by the way. I bought this pedal. I'm not endorsed by Ernie Ball. I just happen to have, I, I thought it looked better to have four of the same types of sets of strings together because the package colors look different. And I thought it would look better in the video to do that. Thank you, Deb. Really appreciate that. Um, so uh, that's why I use the Ernie Balls. I just happened to have, I went to the store to get the, the, the 10s and the 11s, I think it was. I have a music store um, about one mile from the studio where I go. And I when I need strings, I go buy strings. Uh, so, um, and some of you said, is this pedal worth it? I'm sure it is, but I haven't tried it yet. I've just bought it yesterday. Um, do I like Ernie Ball strings versus D'Addario strings? <laughs> you know, uh, I've never tested them against each other. As a matter of fact, I never changed the strings in a descending manner like that. I just noticed that when I high passed the guitar before going into a um, into an amplifier, that it tightened up the sound. That's kind of a known thing that people have been doing, that, especially people that tune down to um, to a really low tuning. It's uh, it would always tighten up the um, it would always tighten up the sound. There's another misconception that you can't tune thin strings down. Um, I would tune, I would use nines or tens on my guitar and tune it down to C uh, with bands that would play in drop C all the time. I did it constantly, never had any problems. I tune a Gibson Les Paul down. Um, so, you know, we'll, uh, we will put that, that thing to a test in, uh, in, um, uh, at, at a later date here. Um, Dimitri says, are you the only one from Russia here? I'm sure there's other people from Russia here. Um, what's the most important thing to sound to sound is practice, Mark says. Well, that's actually true. That's what you really spend your time on. Spend your money on your instrument and spend your uh, your time practicing and creating new music. Uh, what are my thoughts on the Line 6 Helix and other products similar to it? Um, I have a Line 6 Helix that I bought. I didn't get one for free from them. Um, and it's good. I've got presets that I made for it with uh, with my assistant, uh, Ken, Grand Lanyon. Um, uh, you know, that's all, for some people, that's all they can afford. They can't afford to, to, an amplifier, things about that. I'm seeing the news about Kobe Bryant here. I don't like to comment on things that I haven't seen. That's that's terrible if that's true. Um, yeah, and 5 Watt World, by the way, my friend Keith did a great video on Tube Screamers that you guys should watch. Um, anyways, uh uh, discount code RB350, 35% off everything in my store. That's how I support my channel is through selling books, mugs, and my uh, and and my t-shirts. I've got some new t-shirt designs coming out, by the way. Um, so, you know, a, a foot pedal, you know, sometimes people can only afford one distortion pedal many times. You know, they have an amplifier, they have one amp, and you know they're they can they want to make that one amp do as many things as possible. So they buy pedals, and that's how they get their their uh, sounds to change. When I was playing in a band, I would uh, uh, I would want to do immediate channel switching or for, go from distorted to clean, and you couldn't do that with channel switching. Uh, so I would use distortion pedals to get um, to get distortion. And the distortion pedal would turn on and off and you could, and that's what I would, you know, that's how I did it because I wanted those immediate changes like that and play with dynamics. But now they have things where, you know, we didn't have all the switchers and things like that that are out now where you can go and use multiple amps or, you know, or have X effects or things like that. None of that was available 20, 20 years ago when I was playing. Um, anyway, so that's, uh, 
you know, when people ask me this stuff about where to spend money, because I get asked that a lot, uh, what you should spend money on, always instruments. And then whatever changes the sound of those instruments, like strings and pickups on electric guitars, drum heads on drums, right? Uh, you know, these these things are are huge. They really can change the tone dramatically. They change the attack. They change the resonance. They change the tone. You can change the pitch by learning how to tune a drum differently. Uh, same thing with basses. You know, you have your DI sound. You have your amp sound. Your amp might be a dark glass pedal, the Alpha Omega, which I love. Or you might use the dark glass plug-in. Uh, or, or I might use my SVT that I have. I have a 1968 SVT. But I'm going to also record a DI in case I want to change the sound after. And I might change the sound through a plug-in. I might use a, a Sans amp on it. I might use an amp simulator on it. Anything. I might combine the amp sound with the DI, making sure they're in phase to get the sound that I'm looking for. So, um, you know... That is extremely important. People spend so much money on things that don't make as big a difference as you would think. Uh, but, you know, the speaker cabinet makes a bigger difference than the amplifier does, right? The microphone makes a bigger difference than the mic pre. Okay, so you have those two combinations of things. You have your instrument into the amplifier, the pickups, right? have a big, make a big difference in the sound of the guitar. Um, and the strings make the pickup sound differently and react differently, okay? So uh, you have to think of what things function as EQs. The pickup is an EQ. The speaker cabinet is an EQ. You have an EQ on your amp, okay, if you have an amp. You have uh, a, a microphone that's an EQ, and you have an EQ on the mic pre, on some mic pre's. So, um, uh, you know, obviously, uh, Rick just talked about, please consider discussion about odd and even harmonics between tube and solid state amps. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, tube amps have a different type of distortion. Where I'm not going to, I don't want to necessarily get into that today. I will make a video on that. Um, but, uh, uh, you, you want to be able to get the, theoretically, the most variance in tone with the least amount of, of gear. This is kind of one of Keith's thing, his minimalist approach. I have an approach that's, uh, where I always would buy one of everything. I had one guitar with P90s, which is at... Les Paul Special or Junior right there. One guitar with PAFs, uh, my Les Paul Custom. I have the, the well, I have two. Then I have a guitar. I actually have two guitars with P90s. Or actually, the 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 Les Paul Special has P100s. The, the, my gold top has P90s. The, um, the black Les Paul has Mission PAFs, which are more like an original 59 PAF spec. And then I have a Custom that, ha that has a different sounding... Um, humbucker in it, slightly different sounding. I have a Strat, I have a Tele, um, I have a uh, a guitar with a vibrato bar, my um, my custom 24, that's a loner guitar from, from uh, PRS. I have the 594, that's also a loner guitar. And, um, and the, uh, the, 594, the, the PRS 594, has the pull pots that actually make some of the, the uh, split the coils and the pickups. And you can get really, really different sounds from those. So, um, you know, that's a very versatile guitar right there. Um, it is, uh, um, so that's something else to, uh, that's something else to consider when you're spending your hard-earned money on these things. Um, what, what gauge spaghetti do you eat? Um, I have one Gretsch guitar. It's a Chinese-made um, Gretsch guitar that's back there. 
Uh, it's it sounds good. It's not it's not a phenomenal guitar, but I think it plays really well. I haven't played it in a while. Uh, anyway, so that's kind of my discussion on this. That uh, that when you're considering these things, uh, you know, if you have an instrument and you want to change your sound, think about changing your gauge strings. That's the easiest, cheapest way to do it. You don't have to change your pickups. You don't have to change anything. Strings make a difference. Okay. Granted, you can take the low end of your amp or take your, your EQ and just high pass it and take the low end off it and get the similar sound or tighten up the tighten up the mids or add some more mid-range to it. You know, the pick does make a difference. The thickness of the pick and the and the way that you angle a pick. Uh Pat Matheny plays with his pick this way. Okay. So there's more surface area when he's picking. A lot of players that are fast shredders will play with a very pointy, thin jazz pick, so there's less drag, okay? But that has a very different sound with it. So um, anyhow, so that's, I, you know, people like the Edge play with the rough part of the pick, or Brian May plays with a coin, because uh, they want the the edge of it will give it a chime, will create a, a, a harmonic, give it more harmonic content and make the guitar chime. Okay, especially through amps like uh, like Vox's. And uh, that makes a huge, huge difference. Absolutely huge difference. So, um, Renzo, there is a difference between 8s, 9s, 10s, and 11s, and we prove that. That doesn't mean... That, uh, that you have to go and change your gauge strings. I, I was just pointing out that there is a difference. And when people say that, you know, that's just a thing that people that are repeaters repeat. Just like the people that don't believe that John Bonham, they used an echo on when the levee breaks. You know, when I, and I show Andy Johns who recorded and mixed the record and they don't believe him. They believe Jimmy Page. It's like, no, this guy mixed the record. He recorded the drums. He knows how he <laughs> he knows how he mixed it. I have him in the video saying how he did it. And you can hear it clearly. Okay, so that's it. If you want to support the channel, you can become a member of the Beato Club or uh, buy something in the store. I got the Beato book only in PDF. I only have the, the version two. I'm going to print out my, my 3.0. One, I need to do that. I have the updated 3.0 version. 35% off RB350. You want to support the channel? That's how you do it. Buy a t-shirt, buy a mug, something like that. That's how I make a living and keep making videos for free. I have a new video on modes. I'm continuing on to remake all my videos on modes. That's coming out. I've got more. Um, uh, I have more um, What Makes the Sun Great videos in the pipeline. You guys are amazing. Really appreciate it. If you haven't checked out the new video on string gauges, check that out. Thank you all for watching. You guys are the best. I had a great time today. Bye.